I want to start out talking a little bit about, for those of you who aren't from northeastern Kentucky, just a little bit because, you know, we talked yesterday that it is an Appalachian community and has all the issues that Appalachian communities have, so this won't be a whole lot new to you, but I just want to give you just a couple of uh, reference points here. Go ahead. This is a map that most of you are probably going to be familiar with. It is the Appalachian Regional Commission's uh, map in terms of the financial situations and just the overall situation in our counties in, Appala in Central Appalachia. I want you to look particularly, and I want you to see the big red blob in the middle. That's where you're seated. And it is an area that Appalachian Regional Commission designates distressed and has forever been. Uh, from time to time, some of the counties will show up uh, a little less red, but for the most part, that's pretty much where we stay. Okay, Tim. I also want to show you some data that just came out uh, in the last month. Most of you will be familiar with the county health rankings. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson and University of Wisconsin, yeah, that gathers this data and they put these numbers out every year. And uh, they're, they're pretty much meant to be just reference points because all we get from it is benchmarking, that sort of thing. In terms of where the other counties are in your state, we also get national benchmarking from it, but in terms of where you are in your state, these are the numbers. There are 120 counties in Kentucky, if you don't know. These are the counties that are around us. These are just some of the counties that we tried to serve with the grant. And as you can see, they're almost at the bottom, every one of them. Uh, Round County is a little bit different because where you are now is Round County. No, it's not Rowan. I don't know what I'm saying. It's Round County. And Round County is a little more affluent than counties around us. We are a college town. And we do have a few more resources than the communities around us. But as you can see, we, and you got to understand that in case you don't, you need to be, if you're number one, that's the best position to be in. Anything past 100 is really bad, like Elliott County. And I also want you to understand something else about this. And this, this could be a whole presentation by itself, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. In the first column, health outcomes, that's more like a snapshot. That's where we are today, sort of. And it specifically looks at morbidity mortality data. And the other column is where we're going to be if we don't change things. Okay, it looks at things that uh, we have an opportunity to have an impact on in that second column. And those are bad numbers for us. They're not as bad as they are in southeastern Kentucky, but there's still yet things that we can work on as communities in northeastern Kentucky to change those numbers. And I will tell you, this isn't part of the People's Clinic Grant, but I will also I want to point out that some of our folks here are from Saddle County, Ohio. Let's raise your hand, get recognized. Yeah. We are starting to work on a project up there because there are 88 counties in Ohio. And what most people don't know, several of those are Appalachian communities. And you don't typically think of Ohio, but they are. They're Appalachian communities and they're distressed Appalachian communities. Sioux County in Ohio, in terms of the 88 counties, is 88. So we're going to be seeing a lot of each other. We're working up there uh, on some of these issues. But these are the counties that we try to make an impact on in the last two changes program. Go ahead, Tim. Now, as I said, uh, typical Appalachian communities around your low socioeconomic status. Uh, lots of unemployment, even more in the last few years, of course. We have a lot of people who are uninsured and underinsured, and I didn't get you any numbers, just suffice it to say, that's how it is. We are mostly a health professional shortage area, not in Round County, because we do have a wonderful hospital here and a, uh, a good medical uh, community. But we also serve everybody around us who are health professional shortage areas. Uh, very poor health outcomes, as I showed you on the graph and lots of chronic disease, as you can imagine. The big ones, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. The big ones, okay? 
Uh, if you go online and look at the county health rankings, you should see high smoking numbers, high obesity numbers, all the things that you expect with chronic disease. Okay. Go ahead, Tim. So, I came to the People's Clinic three years ago, and when I came to the clinic, uh, it was wonderful, smooth operation, and on Tuesdays they saw people back to back to back to back to back, just as fast as they could see them, depending on what providers they had for that day. But what I was immediately struck with is that the phone rang all day. They don't answer the phone because it's somebody else wanting in. And you can pretty much either do the work that's to be done that day or you can sit and answer the phone. What happens is all those people who are phoning in all day are going on a waiting list. And then some, one of the volunteers will pick them off the telephone and put them on the list and call them back. And that's improved a little bit today, but it's still a sad situation. And at the time when I came, we had almost 100 people on that waiting list. Now, you know, we're talking about people who had no provider, no insurance, and were at 200% of the federal poverty guideline. So it was a sad situation, it still is, and, and I'm not looking for that to get better right away, but we clearly had to have some way to impact that. So thinking about that, go ahead, Tim. We determined the best way to do this was going to be if we could just keep those people from wanting to, to from needing to come into the to the clinic to start with. Okay, we don't do acute care for the most part. We we kind of try to manage whatever's going on at the time and get them. It's just um, the kind of care that you know I haven't seen a physician in five years and I've got diabetes. My blood sugar runs 400. You know that sort of thing. So we want to try to keep people well. So we start talking to the community. Got some focus groups, we went to some churches. That's where you always start in Appalachia. That's why we're here. So we went to some churches and we visited with ministerial associations, uh, other existing groups wherever we can, chambers of commerce, and all sorts of different places that where we could talk to people about the situation in our counties. We did surveys throughout our community and the one that we really wanted to get the most bang for our buck was a simple list of conditions and situations that, that impact health. And we asked people wherever we could go, circle the top three. They were based on Healthy People 2010. And we just asked them to circle the top three. And they were things like, do we have issues with obesity, smoking, you know, all the things that are on the outcomes for the uh, Healthy People 2010. And it turned out that we didn't get good stuff from that because they were all over the place, which said we got problems with all these issues. So that led us to understand we needed to be dealing with all those problems and not any particular one. So we had to think about how that was going to happen. Uh, this is, if you're familiar with it at all, started out a community-based participatory research project. So we came, we had partners, People's Clinic, St. Clair Regional Medical Center, uh, who wound up doing our fiscal management for the grant. Uh, Morehead State University, who originally was going to do evaluation for the grant and wound up not doing that, they had some restructuring. And then we went to the churches and said, this is what we want to do and we can't do it without you, will you help? We had five churches originally sign on to the grant to be partners and help us get it started. Uh, some of that them didn't wind up being partners and then we added more too so so then the grant went to Health Resources Service Administration the outreach program and it's a rural development grant that looks at exactly what we were trying to do and that was to try to improve the health of people in rural communities and we were funded uh, a sizable grant for three years to try to make some impact on the uh, health of the people in our counties. Go ahead, Tim. Okay, so the program model. Our target population was people who were uninsured because that was the population that went to the people's clinic, uh, people who were uninsured. We don't collect money at the people's clinic, no money, zero, none. From time to time, people will drop money into the donation box, but we do not collect money for anything. We do not take Medicaid. 
uh, we don't even take care of people past who are able to have Medicare, so we don't take Medicaid. We don't do children 18 to 62, more or less, and so, and people who don't have insurance. Now, what we found out as the grant went along that there was a population of people who absolutely weren't getting care at all, and that was the people who worked at a place who didn't have decent insurance for them. That's the population that was falling through the cracks. People who had what we call crisis insurance, where their deductible was so high they absolutely had to be dying to get any health care, even though they had insurance. You know that population. So as we went along, we worked with Wade, who was here yesterday. Some of you met Wade and heard his presentation. And worked with the people at HRSA. And we determined that we would take those people in as well. And also, the management at the, P at the People's Clinic, we sat down and talked, and we decided let's go up to 250% federal poverty guidelines because there were just people who were getting missed. So we did have to make that change. So in terms of referral, we did some marketing in the newspapers about, and uh, our churches that we partnered with did some marketing and so forth. and. We, word of mouth, and primarily what happened was we had our clinic on Thursday evening. And we, they called me, I had the cell phone, and they called me to make sure they were eligible and that they understood the program. And so then I put them in to the Thursday evening clinic uh, for the visit. Because this is how it worked. They had to come first to the clinic to get their initial workup. When they got to the clinic on Thursday evening, and we asked them to be there for several hours because we wanted to spend some time with them and, and start on this process of making some behavior changes, okay? So, um, the first thing they did was have a physical assessment. Where are you, Amber? That is Amber and Smith, and Amber was our uh, nurse practitioner who saw everybody who got enrolled into the program. They started with her. Of course, they initially had some uh, workup in terms of uh, physical uh, lab work and so forth, and vital signs, of course, and that sort of thing. Weight and uh, BMI and so forth done. And so then Amber saw them and did a bit of a physical assessment and a history and so forth, as good as you could get anywhere. And then she could get some lab work. And we had originally an arrangement with St. Clair uh, who gave us very discounted rates on whatever lab work we needed to do. And then later on, uh, John Well, Joan, you want to stand up? Who is here? She's, remember, she's sick. <laughs> she's here. Uh, she uh, wrote a grant at one point to get a point of care testing machine that turned out to be considerably less costly than what we were using. So she, um, after that point, our lab work was a little bit less than it was. But once they saw Amber and had their physical assessment done, then Roger, who you've already met, did their lab work. We got a lab right at the clinic. We basically looked at things like cholesterol and uh, blood sugar and those screening kind of things, unless we needed to get more labs. And if we did, he would draw and send to the hospital. Everybody saw a nutritionist and because what you eat, as you know, affects absolutely everything. So everybody saw a nutritionist and had uh, an opportunity to spend 30 minutes, 60 minutes with her and talk about it. And we took the family, you know, we talked yesterday about the matriarchal society that is Appalachia. So we took in the cook everywhere, every chance we got and the uh, client as well. And once we got those things and had opportunities to do a good assessment and spend some time with that client, then we had another nurse practitioner who sat down with that person and did a contract. And we used uh, motivational interviewing, some of you may be familiar with, and we used uh, the trans theoretical model of change, and you know, we did it scientifically, evidence-based and so forth. And we all learned to do those things. And they sat down with the client and made a contract. This is what I want to change. This is the change that I need to make in my life, a change that will last and improve my health. Okay, so once we got that done, 
here's what had to happen from then on out. That wasn't going to be enough. That's never going to be enough. There is a brief intervention that we tried and we did it uh, in the clinic in case people didn't show up to what came next. But what came next was they were assigned to a wellness coach. Uh, ladies, stand up. I want you to see the wellness coaches. This, they're at the end of a long, hard journey. <laughs> Those are some of the wellness coaches that we worked with for the past three years. And here's what happened. As you very well know, that one little brief intervention that we did at the clinic just wasn't going to make for a lasting change. So what happened is the wellness coaches were trained to continue that support and continue that education that they got while they were at the clinic on an ongoing basis. So we had curriculum developed for 10 modules, which just happened to fit those 10. Remember I told you up front we did the survey and let people circle and say what they thought were the problems. We developed modules, curriculum modules for them to teach from. But they also had the latitude of going completely off curriculum and talking about what the people at the meeting wanted to talk about. Because one time a month, the uh, wellness coaches held at their church, which hosted the meetings. You've got to have somewhere to meet in Appalachia that's absolutely church buildings. But the wellness coaches host at their church a uh, meeting. It is educational. It is support. They knew what the contract was with the individual people and worked toward those goals and are continuing to do that. So that's pretty much how it worked. And we had, go ahead Tim, we had some challenges uh, along the way. Of course you always do. Uh, for starters, in the very first year, recession hit Appalachia, okay? It had already hit the rest of the country before that the rest of the country was hopefully starting to heal, but you know how I pledge, we don't do things at the same speed everybody else does. We're a little bit behind. Uh, that was my one. Anyway, the recession hit, and we had more people losing jobs, and we had more people with no insurance, and we had more people, remember those of you here yesterday, how Wade talked about, there are people who are so bogged down with trying to survive the last thing they worry about is stopping smoking or losing weight or eating healthier or exercising. They're worried about the thing that took their time and their mind was, how do I survive? So the recession hit the program hard. We had difficulty enrolling people, for starters. And that just, you know, that boggles your mind, I'm sure. Because what I didn't tell you was every time these people came to see us, even to their meeting or to the clinic, they got a $20 gift card for gas. So we were supporting them that way. So we still had trouble enrolling people. And the simple fact of the matter is people were more concerned about how they were going to survive than being part of a health change. Uh, and not only them, but the churches. We had churches who dropped because Pastors didn't want to devote time for that, you know, the, the wellness meeting when they needed to be having uh, evangelistic meetings, recruitment meetings, and things like that. They wanted to use the wellness coaches that were working for us to do other things. So we lost some churches. We lost some people. And if we talked about it and pretty much agreed that that's what the issue was because the recession hit just about the time we were getting going good. Okay, so... Nonetheless, lots of things happened in that program, and our wellness coaches have lots of uh, opportunities to uh, make differences in people's life, and they still are. We still have about six months uh, of funding left, even though the grant ends officially Monday. We still have a little bit of money left to continue working, and our goal is to try to make a strong Health Ministries a Collaborative here in Northeastern Kentucky with the wellness coaches that we have, hence the education today. Um, we also put into that last six months of funding an opportunity for them to go down to that Health Ministries Association meeting that Sharon talked about yesterday. And we're going to try to keep the gains that we've made going uh, in Health Ministries. Um, I'm going to ask one of my wellness coaches just to stand up and just to give you an idea of one of the things I asked them to do case studies examples not numbers but case studies uh, 
Barbara, you on microphone and tell us about one of the one of our major successes. Barbara's going to talk about a client who came to us in the very first week of the program. Now these are not public speakers and they're all nervous, so cutting some slack. <laughs> This was one of my members uh, that came to the People's Clinic. Uh, she wrote me a letter, and this is what she said. She said, I'm not going to use her name. She said, hi, my name is Jane Doe. I just wanted to express how I appreciated the People's Clinic and what they have done for me. For the past 10 years, my husband has been in prison, and I am a single mother trying to live and raise a child. I have no insurance for myself, and I had nowhere to go to get help. I was introduced to the program by the, my church, by Maddie Burton, in 2009. I went and had blood work done, a physical, and I also needed a lot of dental work. And Dr. Tingle, he gave me the opportunity to feel better about myself. In 2010, they discovered a lump in my belly that caused a problem. This was a concern for my health. They immediately got me in to see a doctor. Um, they got me going in the right direction. The test result, the results showed that I had a tumor growing on my ovary. I had to have a complete hysterectomy done. The program put me together and successfully operated shortly after they found the tumor. I am very thankful for the People's Clinic and the staff there. The meetings at the Lasting Changes are very interesting. They have different topics. They are concerned about health, exercises, nutrition, etc. We keep track of our weight and we try to help others work toward our goals. I would recommend this program to anyone that has a health concern. Thank you for the opportunity to express my gratitude for this program. That lady is a blessed, blessed Christian woman who works at a fast food, and she had, couldn't afford the insurance. Simply couldn't afford, she had nothing. She was hemorrhaging significantly on a routine basis, and her blood work, she, she would have died but she came to lasting changes. In terms of wellness and so forth, she her goal was to lose weight, and I wish you could see her, she's skinny anyway, but she thought she needed to lose a little weight. <laughs> uh, ladies, one more of you wanna go? Janet, would you read, stand up and do, yeah, do one of yours. Let me say something while Janet's coming to get the microphone. Uh, Sharon didn't realize that she did it, but she misspoke. Jen is from the Christ Community Church. It's in Olive Hill. It's in Carter County. So, not Moorhead. Those of you from Moorhead are probably wondering where our church was. It's in Olive Hill. Uh, my history is of the lady uh, that came into our group in the very beginning. And she set a goal of eating healthier. And this lady never was large, but she thought she had to lose weight. However, she. Uh, wanted to eat healthier, and uh, she was uh, diagnosed on uh, uh, beginning the, uh, at the People's Clinic and her lab work with severe osteoporosis, anemia, poor dental health, and she had other uh, issues also. But she received treatment through the People's Clinic for the osteoporosis, the anemia, and she had her teeth pulled through the dental program uh, through the clinic. Uh, she has... Uh, been diagnosed since then with cervical cancer, mm -hmm. has had surgery and completed chemotherapy while attending the Lasting Changes program. Uh, she also cares for her daughter's four children, and she's done this for almost two years now. They're 18 currently, and 15, five, and two years old. And she has returned since she completed the chemotherapy to full-time work and sends the uh, older three children to school. The youngest child, uh, who was four months old when she took charge of her, uh, has been sick most of her life due to complications uh, in childbirth, or rather in pregnancy, before she was born. 
And Marcella has come through all this and done very well. She wants to continue with the Lasting Changes group, even though the uh, money is getting short. But she plans to continue because she loves the support and the interactions from the other members. That's another issue that we uh, dealt with quite, quite frequently. As you can uh, imagine, if you know all the issues around the drug, prescription drug issues in Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky especially, is a lot of grandmothers raising their grandchildren. We, we ran into that often. So. Uh, 